Hey y'all, hope everybody's having a great day today. Um, today we're going to cover chapter 5, which are the tissues in our textbook. So tissues, don't forget, tissues are made out of cells. We talked about cells in our last chapter 4. Cells, again, are the smallest living structures on the planet, and they're also the kind of the fundamental units of life things that build bigger organisms. And so today we're going to look at these tissues. And so cells, whenever we look at multicellular organisms, when we look at bigger organisms, then cells combine themselves to create something called tissues in order to make bigger functions happen in the body. So whatever one cell is doing, if you want more of that to be done, then you can just add more cells in that area and you're going to get a bigger effect. So if one cell, for example, is making a secretion, but you need a lot of secretion, well, it's going to take a long time for that one cell to make it. But if you have a million of those cells working together at the same time, making those same secretions all at once, then you're going to be able to make it quickly. And so that's really what tissues do. Tissues, a good definition of a tissue that I want you to go ahead and take now, are groups of cells working together for a common function. Okay, groups of cells working together for a common function. So again, we're going to have cells that are kind of doing the same thing. Um, we can use different groups of cells that are working together for a common function, different tissues. And we can combine all those together, and then we can create organs with them. So that's what we're looking at here. In order to really understand anatomy and physiology um, throughout 2.10 and 2.11, we really need a fundamental understanding of tissues. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. First off, again, cells are organized in more complex units called tissues, and these tissues, again, groups of cells, but they are performing a common function. That's really the key definition for a tissue, not just groups of cells working together, but groups of cells working together for a common function, a common goal. Um, we've already mentioned this, but don't forget that the term histology, hist refers to tissue, and ology, of course, is the study of. So histology is the study of tissues. When we look at this, go ahead and give yourself a note that there are four main tissue types. There is epithelial tissue, there is connective tissue, there is muscle tissue, and there is nervous tissue. Now, before we go any further, let's just go ahead and put down a little bit of brief information while we're introducing these four tissues, because that's really what the rest of the chapter is all about, especially these first two. Okay, So epithelial tissue. I want you to know that epithelial tissue, and again, you should be taking notes, epithelial tissue is important to create two groups of sub-tissues. The first one is called epithelium, and that sounds silly, but epithelial is the bigger group of tissues, and what the first subgroup is called is epithelium. Epithelium covers the body, and it lines the inside of the body. Now, the other component of epithelial tissue is glandular tissue. Glandular tissue, your glands, your um, endocrine structures or exocrine structures are made out of epithelium. And we'll talk about these a little bit more. We've kind of mentioned them a little bit. But we'll talk about these glands here today. Let's skip connective tissue for just a second. Let's talk about muscle next. Muscle tissue. I want you to know that it is specialized to contract and produce movement. So there's real two important parts there to its function, to its definition of what muscle is. It contracts and it produces movement. Okay, so it's going to shorten. In the process of shortening, we're going to create some sort of movement from that. Go ahead and, and make a note that there are three types of muscle. The three types of muscle are skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. So let's take a little note about each. Skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Obviously, let's start with the easy one, cardiac. Okay, cardiac means heart, and so cardiac muscle, you can give yourself a note, is found in the heart, right? This is what pumps blood. So your heart muscle pumping blood is cardiac muscle, all right? The next one is skeletal that we're going to cover. Skeletal muscle is attached to your skeleton, so give yourself a note, attaches to bones, and it moves your body overall. So it moves your body. Whenever we talk about overall body movement, moving around in our environment, that's what skeletal muscles do. And the last type is smooth. So 
realize that if it's not in your heart and it's not attached to a bone making your body move, then it is a type of smooth muscle in your body. So that's an easy way to remember it. Every other muscle besides those two, those two groups, are going to be smooth. But one place that I always want you to remember smooth muscle is that it lines the walls of tubes of vessels in your body. If you've got a vessel in your body, cardiovascular, respiratory, n n reproductive, urinary, if you've digestive, you know, if you've got a tube in your body, then that tube is more than likely going to have some smooth muscle in the wall of that tube. And I want you to know that that smooth muscle, it's super important for controlling flow through the tube. And so, a lot of times when we talk about smooth muscle, we're going to talk about the muscle in blood vessels for vasoconstriction and vasodilation, if you've ever heard those terms before. So muscle, again, contract, produces movement, and three flavors, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. The next tissue is nervous tissue. Nervous tissue, it produces and distributes action potentials. Now, I know a lot of times you may have heard the nervous system sends signals. It sends nervous impulses, electrical signals. Well, we're going to start out and we're just going to go ahead and learn the proper term for those signals are called action potentials. I like to call them APs a good bit. So you'll hear me abbreviate that um, a lot, AP. So again, the definition of the nervous tissue is to produce and distribute AP, action potentials. And we'll talk a little bit more about this whenever we get to the later part of this chapter. But also, we've got chapters, let's see, 12 through 16 that are going to cover the nervous system. So we're going to see this in a lot of chapters this semester. And then we've got a whole chapter 10 that's going to cover our muscles, our skeletal muscles specifically. So again, this chapter is really about these two, epithelial and connective. Let's talk about connective tissue now since we haven't yet. Connective tissue, you notice that I've mentioned we've got coverings and linings and glands. We've got muscles and we've got the nervous system, you know, your brain, your spinal cord, your nerves. Anything else in the body, is a type of connective tissue. So that's the reason that I left it for last, is that connective tissue is kind of a catch-all category. There are three groups of connective tissues. So we can go ahead and take a note about this. Three groups of connective tissue, and again, I like to call connective tissue CT, kind of like I call action potential APs. It's just easier when you're taking notes instead of writing these terms out. You can abbreviate, make life easier. So CT, it's function, it's got three functions. The first major function comes from the first group of connective tissue called CT proper, connective tissue propers. These guys do what the name implies. They connect other tissues together. The second group is supporting connective tissues. Supporting connective tissues support the body. Things like bones. That's a type of supportive connective tissue. And the last group are fluid or transport connective tissues. And the good example is your blood. So blood carries gases, nutrients, waste, everything. So again, connective tissue, its main job is to connect other tissues. But it does other things because it includes other tissues. So it is providing support and also providing transport. Now, as I mentioned, this chapter is really going to focus on these two, epi and CT. And so we're going to jump right in. We're going to go ahead and let's start talking about epithelial tissue. And then we'll move on and talk about connective tissue before we finish up with muscle and nervous. So here is our first slide dealing with epithelial tissue. And whenever we talk about epithelial tissue, this is one place where stem cells are extremely important. And so I, I definitely want you to understand what a stem cell is. Many people have some sort of, um, you know, opinion on stem cells, but they may not understand scientifically actually what they are in order to actually have an informed opinion. So a stem cell is an undifferentiated cell. So we see that term right here. It's undifferentiated. It doesn't have an identity. But really what a stem cell is, so this is one of the parts of a definition for a stem cell. It's undifferentiated. It itself doesn't have an identity. What I want you to know about a stem cell, what it really is, is a stem cell undergoes mitosis and makes all the cells the body needs. So whenever we replace cells that are dying, right now, every minute 
you have millions of red blood cells that die. You're made up of 25 trillion red blood cells. So every minute you have millions that die, but we need to replace those. So in the bone marrow of your bones in the center of them, we have stem cells. And these stem cells are going to produce these brand new red blood cells all the time. So a stem cell, it's really kind of like a mother cell. And a lot of times we refer to the cells that it makes as daughter cells. So kind of, you know, the stem cell is the mama and the mama's sitting there and her job is simply to make brand new cells. Okay. So stem cells, very important. Um, we can use these, this type of technology to help grow tissues or grow um, effects or functions in the body that may have been lost. And so that's the reason stem cell research is so important and, and some of these stem cell treatments are so important um, because they have so much power, um, the ability to create something that the body may not be able to create. Okay, now let's move forward. Let's talk about, again, the two different types of epithelial tissue. We have epithelium, and whenever we look at epithelium, don't forget that epithelium covers and lines. So it covers on the outside, and it lines on the inside. So here's where it says it covers the body surface, so things like your skin, and then it lines the inside of the body. For example, the inside of your blood vessels or your digestive tract, things like that. And then we also have the glandular tissue. And that glandular tissue, again, just forms the glands. If we have any gland in them, then that's made of epithelial, it's made of glandular epithelial tissue. Now, again, this epithelium, let's discuss a couple characteristics about the epithelium itself. Not the glandular, but just the linings and coverings. These guys are usually one or more layers that are closely packed together. They don't have very much in between them, extracellular matrix. We haven't discussed that term yet. But what this is, is anything between cells. So what this tells us, if there's little to no space between cells, then these cells are closely packed together. But here's a key feature that you should never forget. Epithelium is avascular. It doesn't contain blood vessels. So epithelium, we can't repair it because it doesn't have blood vessels. We can't repair it. We have to regenerate it. We have to use one of those stem cells that we just talked about to create a brand new cell instead of trying to repair that old cell that has been damaged. Now, let's mention very quickly how we classify um, epithelial tissue. So epithelial tissue, um, especially the epithelium, okay, so this is how we classify the epithelium, two different ways. The first way is based on the cell's layers, and the second way is based on the cell shape. So let's talk about the cell layers real quick. So again, this is number one. The first way to classify epi is by its layers. So either it is a simple layer or it is stratified. Simple epithelium is only one cell layer thick. So this is where we're not going to have as much stress, as much physical kind of wear and tear. But also I want you to realize simple epithelium is very important in places where we're going to absorb or secrete. Okay, so that's a good function of simple epi is absorption and secretion. At your lungs, it sounds, sounds kind of weird, but you're absorbing oxygen in through this epithelium into the bloodstream and secreting back out CO2. So absorption means to get in and secretion means to get out, right? So same thing in the intestines, we're absorbing nutrients into the intestines and at blood vessels we're moving things in and out at capillaries for example. Now stratified epithelium, two or more layers, that's pretty easy. Either, if you're simple you're just one layer, if you're more than one layer you're called stratified. But I want you to know this is more for protection. This is where we're going to find we're going to find this in areas with more mechanical stress, more rubbing, more physical wear and tear. Okay, so stratified, many layers is more protective. That just makes sense. Now, when we classify based on shape, this, there are three main shapes, squamous, some people say squamous, but squamous, either way, these are flat, thin and flat. Okay, a lot of times they may look like a fried egg. Um, so just kind of weird, irregular shape with just kind of a bulging nucleus many times. Sometimes it's flattened, sometimes it's bulging. 
Okay. The second flavor, second type, is cuboidal. These guys look like cubes in cross sections, but we're going to see an image here in a second and see that many times cells are more hexagonal. Okay. But cuboidal cells, these guys are more uh, about the same height as they are width. So they're about as tall as they are wide. If you're taller than you are wide, then you are a columnar cell, like a column, not too tough. And so here, let's take a take a look. There's a nice image in your textbook that you can find. Here is, and this is wrong, this is a simple epithelium. This is not stratified. We can see there's a nucleus and there's only one nucleus in this entire layer. Compared to down here, all these nuclei and cells, we've got many stacks of layers. So this is a simple epithelium and because it's thin and flat, we're going to assume that this is a squamous cell. And here we can kind of see how that nucleus kind of bulges a little bit and it kind of looks like a fried egg kind of flattened around it. Again, squamous cells are going to be about as tall as they are wide. And here we can even see in 3D how they look more hex than they are square or cubed. And then columnar, same thing, more of a hex, but these guys are taller than they are wide. And again, we can see that nucleus inside each of the cell, and that kind of helps us to kind of figure out right here. We see a nucleus kind of flat, not about the same height as width and not taller, so there's going to be another squamous cell. So this is a stratified squamous, and here is a simple squamous, and that's how we're going to name these. So we put the two together, the layer plus the shape, and and that tells us which type of tissue it is. Now, we're going to look at all these different types of epithelia in lab. So we're not going to review these right now, but in your textbook there are many images that help you review that for lab. Let's Let's talk about a little bit more characteristics dealing with this epithelium. The first characteristic of epithelium, you know, what sets it apart from other tissues in the body. Anytime we're going through this semester and we see characteristics, that's usually what that refers to is, you know, what makes this different than everything else? You know, this is kind of its little personality. So first off, epithelia, we kind of talked about this already, cellularity. What that means is it's almost entirely cells. Okay, I mentioned there's not much room in between them, so tightly packed cells, that's what the word cellularity refers to, that it's mainly cells in this tissue. Many times we have other things in tissues. We have fiber and we have some ground substance. We have some, some stuff that fills in the spaces. But here in epithelium or epithelial tissues, it is mainly just cells. And these cells have two different layers, excuse me, two different sides usually. So we refer to two different sides as being polar. So this characteristic is referred to as polarity. We have an apical surface and we have a basal surface. Apical comes from the word apex. So this means top, right? So the apical surface is the top surface. And usually when we're talking about epithelium, we're going to be talking about the layer that's exposed, right? So the exposed surface, the layer on the top. And then we have a bottom surface called the basal surface. So the basal surface is the bottom of the epithelium or the bottom of the tissue. And this is where we're going to connect to some connective tissue. Now, that connective tissue and that connection with the epithelium on the basal surface is called the basement membrane. So this is another characteristic. Epithelial tissue has a basement membrane. Again, this is what attaches the epithelial tissue to the connective tissue. It's actually the very bottom of the epi and the very top of the CT. And these two layers just kind of combine. And so um, this is, I want you to know, instead of lamina lucida, okay, I want you to call it the basal lamina. So call this the basal lamina. And these are the three layers. I do want you to know these three layers. The basal lamina is actually the bottom of the epithelium. Lamina densa is kind of just a little super glue in between. And then the reticular lamina is the very top of the connective tissue. So if we put the basal lamina of the epi and the reticular lamina of the CT together, and we kind of just add a little extra to keep it connected, then we've just created what's called the basement membrane. Now again, we're going to use rebar. We're going to use fibers, collagen fibers, that are going to act like rebar, that are going to hold these two layers together and keep them from separating. OK? 
okay a good example when these separate if you get a blister on your skin then your epithelium has come detached from your your epidermis has come detached from your dermis your dermis is connective and your epidermis is the epi tissue so we can actually see that so these collagen fibers we don't usually walk around with a bunch of blisters so this rebar these fibers are very strong with that attachment the last characteristic that we're going to see on this slide and it's not the last one overall sorry but the fourth characteristic the um, is a vascularity again a means without and vascular means blood vessels so I definitely want you to know that epithelial tissue is avascular it doesn't contain blood vessels now because of that I do want you to know that it gets its nutrients from the tissues below it from blood vessels in the tissues below it so in the connective tissue below the epi we're gonna have some blood vessels some capillaries and these capillaries are going to supply the the gases and the nutrients for this tissue to stay alive so again ob obtain across the apical surface or from the basal surface so we're gonna absorb it from one from somewhere else Epithelial tissue has extensive innervation. In other words, it has a lot of nervous innervation, it has a lot of nervous tissue connected to it. But anytime we see innervation, a lot of times that means that it has an ability to sense the environment. And so I definitely want you to understand when we mention extensive innervation, this is talking about the ability for epithelial tissue to sense, okay, to become a sense organ what we're talking about here is touch right touch vibration pressure temperature pain all of those are done by epithelial I mentioned it before that epithelial is avascular therefore we can't repair we have to replace the tissue from below so our stem cells are going to be at the very bottom layer of our epi and as we lose layers towards the top instead of trying to repair them we're just going to replace them from below and create brand new cells that will eventually push up and get to that level. So in your skin, it might take about a month for a cell to be born from a stem cell and move all the way up and be shed out into the air, into the environment. And so here, there, we have a high regeneration capacity in epithelium. We regenerate quickly. Okay, These layers can be lost. And it doesn't affect we don't have to try to repair we can just replace it with the next layer below it okay it's kind of like what is it the uh, crocodiles in their teeth then no alligators in their teeth how they just keep having rows and rows of teeth that keep on coming same kind of concept okay again stem cells undergo mitosis and continually replace those lost cells so there's our characteristics. Here's some of those demonstrated. Here's that connective tissue down here. You can even see some fibers. And up here is our epithelial. We know these are columnar, right? And this is a simple layer. It's only one cell layer thick. So we've got a simple columnar layer, and it's on top of some epithelium. Now down here, we see this connection, this basement membrane. Here is the basal lamina, and here is that reticular lamina. And together, they create that basement membrane. Here also is demonstrating polarity because here we can see the exposed apical surface and the attached basal surface. And so there's kind of demonstrating another concept. Now here are functions. Okay, so we just looked at characteristics. What makes epithelium different from other tissues? Now, what how does epithelium what does it do? Okay. First off, as you can imagine, epidermis is a type of physical protection. So your skin, super important for physical protection. Um, abrasion um, dehydration especially you don't think about this but your skin protects you from losing water if you didn't have skin on your body you would sit there and dehydrate to death in 15 minutes or so it wouldn't take very long for you just to lose all the water in your body to the point where you would become non-functional so definitely crazy um, chemicals you know um, radiation things like sunlight so physical protection from a whole lot of different bad things in our environment our epithelial tissue is selectively permeable what that means is it controls what enters and leaves the body okay so that's a very important concept if anything enters or leaves the body it must go across epithelial tissue I mentioned gases in your lungs going across the epithelial tissue of your alveoli and so there 
oxygen goes into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide comes out of the bloodstream. So anything that enters or leaves the body must cross epithelium. Secretions, okay? So uh, we've already mentioned this. Epithelial tissue forms glands. And so we're going to talk about exocrine and endocrine glands. Endocrine secreting into the blood, exocrine secreting onto a surface. And so we'll talk about the difference here in these two secretions. Our epithelial tissue, our epithelium layers of linings can produce secretions like sweat or mucus, right? Or endocrine can make hormones that can control major actions somewhere else in the body. As we mentioned before, along with the nervous tissue, not by itself, but along with nervous tissue, epithelial tissue provides sensation. It provides touch. And again, touch, pressure, pain, temperature, these are all things that um, are basically from the skin. But we are going to modify some of this epithelium and we can turn it into things for taste and smell and sight and hearing and equilibrium. Okay, and we'll talk about those towards the end of the semester. Don't forget, epithelial tissue forms epithelium, the linings and the, and the coverings. And it also forms glands, right? So these glands, these guys are going to produce secretions. So that's a good definition of a gland is a structure that produces secretions. We've only got one individual cell gland, one unicellular gland. Most glands are going to be multicellular in our body. So we'll talk about that. Um, well, let's go ahead and let's learn it. Uh, only unicellular gland that we're going to cover that we're going to talk about is called a goblet cell and a goblet cell is what makes mucus mucin is kind of pre-mucus and so we're going to see goblet cells are the most numerous cell in our body excuse me most numerous gland in our body and they simply just sit there and make mucus all other glands are considered to be multicellular as i mentioned just a second ago Endocrine versus exocrine. Okay, we need to understand that. Endocrine doesn't use ducts, so it doesn't use a passageway, and it's secreted into blood. Anytime we're talking endocrine, we're talking about hormones. Okay, so these guys are going to act like chemical messengers, and these chemical messengers are going to trigger reactions in the target cells that they bind to. Okay, and we'll talk about that in full detail in 2.11. Exocrine glands are what more people tend to be familiar with. Exocrine glands are going to use a duct. They're going to use a passageway. And the whole key is that they are, and it doesn't say it here, and this is kind of sad, but exocrine glands are always secreted onto a surface. So it mentions right there. It's onto a surface through a duct. So going through a passage leading onto the surface of something. For example, sweat, right? So that's a simple one, a, a sweat pore is the duct, right? That's the exit of the duct. But we could also think about things like mucus lining our digestive tract on that, um, those linings, a lot of the time it's a simple columnar layer um, that lines our digestive tract and under, in Embedded in between it are going to be goblet cells, and they're going to make mucus. So, again, it's secreting onto a surface. Here it's not the surface of your skin, but it's the surface of a lining. And so um, there are some good examples. Here it mentions sweat glands, mammary glands, and salivary glands. It's just a few of these. Again, unicellular, um, the most common. The only one that I'm familiar with that we've always talked about, only one, is the goblet cell. So don't forget, goblet cell is the only unicellular gland, and it simply just makes mucus. It's the most common type of gland in our body. Multicellular glands contain more than one cell. That's not too difficult. Now, we kind of organize these cells many times into little clusters. And so we call a cluster an asinus, U.S., or asini is plural, okay? And then we kind of build them up and add them together, and we can create lobes, we can create lobules before that. Multicellular glands, I just want you to understand that these have more than one cell, and these are the majority of the glands. Here's an example of a asinus and a multicellular gland. So here is just a pocket. These cells are going to make secretions. They're going to secrete into this tube, and there is the duct that's going to take that secretion out onto a surface.
Now whenever we're classifying exocrine glands, we've got a couple different ways to classify, but here we're going to classify based on the method of secretion, how it secretes. And we'll talk about these as we go through this semester. We'll mention these types of terms a few times. Merocrine glands, they basically just release bubbles, they release vesicles from the cell surface. So I want you to know that merocrine glands release secretions from vesicles from the cell surface. Let's go look at a picture real quick. I'm going to skip past these and show you this picture. Here's merocrine. See how it's just releasing these vesicles full of secretion straight from the cell surface and they're just going to exit and that's going to become the secretion. Here's our next one, apocrine. So apocrine gland, and I'll go back and I'll show you the details. Here, apocrine gland, what I want you to understand is that it's actually going to chop off part of its cell. It's going to use part of its cell to actually bubble off and chop part of it off and use that as the secretion. Instead of just spitting out tiny bubbles, it packs part of its cell full of these bubbles and then chops that part of the cell off and releases a big part. See, tiny little bubbles versus big chunks, right? So here's an apocrine gland. Again, a, a good example of a merocrine gland would be your salivary glands. A good example of an apocrine gland is the mammary gland or the in the armpits. Okay, they are very similar glands. And then here's the last type of gland, holocrine. Holocrine glands, these guys pack the whole cell full of secretion and look, they're rupturing the entire cell. So they're just killing the whole cell and the cell fragments are what become the secretion. All right, let's go back. Let's roll through those real quick again. So American glands, again, they're going to release vesicles straight from the cell surface. And the ones that were mentioned in the image that I want you to know for the test are the salivary glands. You don't have to know all the rest of these. These are other examples. But here for the test, know that that's a good example, the salivary gland. Okay. Apocrine glands, we're going to pinch off part of the apical surface, right? So part of the apical membrane and cytoplasm. So basically we're going to pack the top of the cell full of secretion and chop off the top. That's what that means right there. So we're chopping off part of the cell and releasing it as the secretion. Again, mammary glands or in your axillary region or pubic regions, the glands that become stinky whenever you reach puberty and you start to grow hair in these locations, right? So at puberty, these apocrine glands are triggered by those sex hormones, and so that's whenever your armpits start to stink and your genitals, the pubic region, will stink just the same. It's got the same stinky glands. And milk, mammary glands, are actually just modified underarm sweat. Mm. Did you have cereal this morning? Oh, never mind. Just kidding. All right. So next, holocrine glands. Holocrine glands, this again is where you pack the cell full of the secretion and then you rupture the entire cell. You just disintegrate the cell and those cell fragments are now being released as the actual secretion. I do want you to know sebaceous glands. I forgot to mention that, but there are the sebaceous glands or the oil producing glands in your skin. They make sebum, but that's the good example of a holocrine gland. Again, there's that image, and the image is good to show you some visuals of how it happens and also um, link back up here to which structures are which glands. Now, that's it for um, epithelial tissue for now. Again, that's probably about half of the chapter almost. Let's take a look now at connective tissue and kind of talk through another big component of this chapter. Connective tissue, again, is going to fill in spaces. It is going to um, connect other tissues together, support and bind other tissues together. So, again, connective tissue or CT. This is the most diverse, most abundant, and widely distributed tissue in the body. So this is the catch-all category. Now here it says that it is cells in a supportive matrix. So let's talk about that. Connective tissue has three parts. First, it has cells. In order to be a tissue, you have to have cells working together. But then it has protein fibers. These fibers add strength to the tissue. So it gives it a more physical function. And then we have 
ground substance. The ground substance, and I still like to call it matrix itself, but this is what fills in the space. I always use an example, and I draw it on the board in class, that if I had a beaker here, if I had a jar, and I put marbles in it, and then I added, marbles would act like cells, and then I added pickup sticks, little, little twigs or something, and I put those in there, chopsticks, you know, those would act like fibers. But then there's still space there, so I could fill it up with water. That would be a liquid ground substance, or I could fill it up with jello, right? Something that would set up and become jelloey. That's a gel ground substance, or I could fill it in with concrete, something that's going to become hard, and that's a solid ground substance. And this is another thing that kind of provides function for this connective tissue. If you want to be a strong connective tissue, a supportive connective tissue, then you need to be more solid. If you want to be less strong but more into transport, then you need to be liquid, for example. And so the ground substance of that connective tissue can kind of help determine what its really main function is doing. So some examples of connective tissues, tendons and ligaments bind things together, muscle to bone, bone to bone. Fat fills in spaces, cartilage and bone, these are our main sort of, and blood is our main um, fluid connective tissue. Okay. Now, in the um, connective tissue, again, we have cells, and many times there are resident cells and there are wandering cells. I don't want you to know the list of each of these. I've just kind of simplified this, but there are some cells that always stay in the tissue, and there are some cells that can come and go, okay? So especially things like the um, nervous, excuse me, immune system, white blood cells, for example, they can enter and leave tissues just want to check it out. But what they're doing is they're checking to see these resident cells and make sure that they're okay, make sure that they're working right, make sure that they're not sick. So there's always the cells that really kind of make up the tissue. That's really the resident cells. And then we have some other cells that we refer to as wandering. Again, I mentioned that the set component are fibers. There are three fibers that we're going to mention. The first is collagen. So collagen is long and unbranched. So collagen is long and unbranched, and it is thick. It says cable-like. It is thick. Okay. If we see it on a, on a slide, it's going to be a thick band in the background, and it's going to kind of be a little, just kind of a little blurry band, almost translucent. Collagen, I want you to know, wants to be pulled from end to end. It provides strength from end to end. Okay. So this is what forms your tendons and your ligaments. Reticular fibers. Reticular fibers are kind of like collagen, but I want you to know that it looks more like a sponge. If you don't know the word reticular, that means net-like. So you can add that. It looks like a net or it looks like a sponge. So reticular fibers, it's made of the same stuff as collagen, but it, instead of being pulled from end to end, I want you to know that reticular fibers can take stress from any direction. So again, it's kind of like a foam padding, right? A foam rubber padding. And so these reticular fibers can take stress from many different directions. We tend to wrap most of our organs with a layer of these types of fibers. The last type of fiber is called an elastic fiber, and you're familiar with that. Elastic fiber, not only does it stretch, everybody likes to say, oh, it stretches. No, well, I can pull collagen but it will stretch to a point where it's non-functioning. The key to elastic, its real function, is recoil. Not only does it stretch, but it recoils easily, right? So stretch and recoil. In your lungs, you've got a lot of this elastic tissue that allows your lungs to inflate with muscles and deflate without muscles. Saves us a lot of energy from not using muscles whenever we exhale. Okay, we'll talk about that. Now here's that matrix or that ground substance. This is what surrounds the cells and the fibers. Okay, so a lot of times they use the term matrix to refer to the ground substance and the fibers. Everything that's not a cell, nowadays they tend to call it matrix. Back when I was learning biology, they used the term matrix just to mean ground substance. These were basically the same thing back in the day. Okay. Now, again, it can be liquid, it can be gel, or it can be solid. So I want you to know that the ground substance kind of gives more characteristics. It gives more function to the tissue. Again, if it's solid, it's going to be more supportive. 
And if it's liquid, it's going to be more used for transport. Okay, here's an example kind of showing a connective tissue, and they're trying to show some of these structures. It's really a hand-drawn image, so it's kind of a crapshoot as to what you're seeing here. But you can see that there's some cells, and there's some fibers, and then there's some, some space, some, some uh, ground substance back in the background. Now, continuing on with these connective tissues, let's, let's go and talk about their functions. Okay, so let's transition into functions. Connective tissues, again, have many different functions. I've already kind of mentioned some. The first is physical protection. Things like bones, right, and adipose. Adipose, again, fills in spaces. Adipose is liquid-filled bubble wrap in your body. And so that's really a protective function is bubble wrapping things, okay? Your bones, of, for example, of the skull, protect your brain, right? So super important. They provide, um, some connective tissues provide support and structural framework. Again, we're talking about bones. Bones and cartilage are the two supportive connective tissues. So definitely important that these two supportive connective tissues, bone and cartilage, kind of build the structure of the body, the framework. Binding of structures. And this is really where the term comes from, right? Connecting structures be a better way of saying that. But connecting structures together. Here, it uses the word ligand, and that's a mistake. It should be ligament. A ligament binds bone to bone, and you should know that. Ligaments, bone to bone, tendon, muscle to bone. Okay, so again, an ACL is an anterior cruciate ligament. So this is a ligament binding the two bones of the knee together, the femur and the tibia. And so if a football player has that ruptured or someone has that ruptured, they can't really bend their knee very well. They don't have stability. Okay, storage. Connective tissue is also important for storage, for example, of energy. Adipose tissue stores um, energy, triglycerides, we talked about that. If you don't burn your carbs, they're going to become fat, and this is how it happens, right? So adipose is that stored energy. Bone also stores calcium and phosphorus. Most of the calcium, like 99% of the calcium, 88% of the phosphorus at any one time are stored in the bones. So important for storage as well. Transport, as I mentioned before, blood and lymph. These guys are carrying important stuff, gases, nutrients, waste, good stuff, bad stuff. Whatever cells need, this is the superhighway, the bloodstream. And so blood is an important connective tissue involved with transporting things around the body. Also in the blood, we have white blood cells. And these guys are super important for immunity. So immune protection, immune function, dealing with white blood cells and also some antibodies in that bloodstream can help protect the body. Again, I've mentioned this, there are three major groups, connective tissue proper, supportive connective tissue, and fluid connective tissue. Again, the connective tissue proper, their main goal is connect other tissues together, and they fill in the spaces between other tissues, things like adipose, okay? Once we get to lab, if you see the term connective tissue at the end of a um, image at the end of one of our tissues, then it is a type of connective tissue proper, okay? So loose connective tissue, dense connective tissue, reticular connective tissue, and um, elastic connective tissue. Those are the four big groups of these propers. Next is supportive connective tissue, okay? Supports other tissues in the body itself. So again, these are bones and cartilage. And then last is fluid connective tissue, blood and lymph are involved with transportation around the body. Again, here's a review. These are the ones that we're going to see in lab. We're not going to talk about them now, but again, connective tissue, connective tissue, connective tissue. If it's got the word connective tissue on it, then it is a type of CT proper. So again, here are some more of connective tissues, but eventually we start to get into cartilage, right? So now we're into the supporting. Here's three flavors of cartilage. Here is bone. And then here is blood, that example of transport. Now, to start to wrap this up and kind of lead us towards the end of this information, let's quickly focus on muscle and on nervous tissue real quick. So muscle tissue, again, I want you to know that it contracts and produces movement. That's a basic function, contracts and produces movement. Again, contraction means that it shortens. And so it's this is going to be a structure that we're going to shorten and in the process of shortening that it's going to create movement. Now as we mentioned we have three flavors skeletal, 
cardiac and smooth muscle. Now we've already mentioned this, but let's take a little look at these. Skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle connects to your bones, connects to your skeleton, and this is responsible for most of the movement that we have in our body. Um, this is voluntary, so you don't have to know it's voluntary muscle tissue. Just know that it is voluntary. It can be controlled voluntarily, right? Um, this is a super important structure or, co or um, kind of characteristic of skeletal muscle. It is multinucleated. It's one of the only cells in the body, along with our osteoclast, that have more than one nucleus. And so this allows these muscles to be highly metabolic and do a lot more activity compared to other cells. We will see these cells have very obvious striations as well. So many times this muscle is referred to as striated muscle too, but cardiac muscle has some stri slight striations, so don't let that confuse you. Again, skeletal muscle connects to bones, moves our body overall, it is voluntary, and it is multinucleated. <clears throat> Cardiac muscle, found only in the heart, and this is what's responsible for causing the heart to contract, so, so the beating of your heart. And again, it doesn't say it here, but this is what's going to cause blood to be pumped through the body. So super important. These guys also have some striations. That's the reason I say don't worry about um, what it said over there about um, skeletal. This textbook says that they could have two nuclei. This is the first textbook I've ever seen that. Um, every other textbook's always said that they only have one, so we're going to stick with that. They only have one. Traditionally, we only have two multinucleated cells, skeletal muscle, and osteoclast. So cardiac muscle, we're going to consider to only have one nucleus, despite what the textbook says. A key feature of cardiac muscle that you need to know is the intercalated discs. Now, first off, I want you to understand that cardiac muscle cells, they kind of look like the big letter Y. And what they do is where they connect, they have three connection spots, one at the bottom of the Y and two there at the top of the Y where it splits. And so it can connect to other muscle cells in the, in the cardiac muscle tissue by these ends of the Ys, ends of the cells, where they connect to each other. It's called an intercalated disc. I want you to know that this connects these cells on the inside. So this is going to connect the cells through channel proteins, through gap junctions. They're going to have their insides connected together. Now what that means, these intercalated discs are super important to create what we call synctum, to sync up all the cardiac muscles together. So it's definitely important that what happens here, these intercalated discs, they connect cardiac muscle cells together so they act as one big unit. Instead of acting as individual cells, that now this cardiac muscle can act as one big unit. Instead of individual cells trying to contract to pump blood, now we can contract the entire unit of the atria or entire unit of the ventricles together to make major contractions. Okay? Now, cardiac muscle doesn't require nervous stimulation. And we'll talk about this in, once we get to 211, how it is automatic, it is autorhythmic, but then our nervous system can adjust that. So if you get excited, you can speed that, um, that heart rate up, or if you kind of start to relax, you can slow it down. Okay, smooth muscle again, this is our last type of muscle. It doesn't have any striations. That's the whole reason it is called smooth. So this is the one that lacks striations altogether, so it appears smooth in appearance. These guys are fat in the middle, tapered at the ends, and these guys are involuntary. Okay, now again, I want you to know that they're found in the walls of tubes. Anywhere that we have a tube in the body, you don't have to list all these, but here, this is digestive, this is respiratory, this is urinary, this is reproductive, this is cardiovascular. So any major tubes in the body, we're going to control flow. Okay, so that's the key. Smooth muscle is found in the walls of tubes. Its function is to control flow, and it is an involuntary type of muscle. Okay. Again, here's an image, and we will talk a little bit more about these whenever we get into lab. The last tissue is nervous tissue. So nervous tissue, again, is um, specialized, and I definitely want you to know its definition, again, its function. Nervous tissue, it produces and distributes action potentials. So again, these APs, 
these are those nervous impulses and those those uh, you know electrical signals that the body, that the brain and the spinal cord are sending. So nervous tissue is found in the central nervous system, the brain, and the spinal cords. Anything outside of the brain and the spinal cord is referred to as a nerve, and that is what's referred to also as part of the peripheral nervous system. Now, when we look at nervous tissue. We've got two basic cells, two groups of cells, neurons and neuroglia. Okay, neurons and neuroglia are glial cells. Neurons, these guys produce and distribute action potentials. So they do the main function of the tissue. They do the same function as the tissue. The tissue gets its function because of the neurons. So about half of the cells in here are neurons, and these guys are going to produce and distribute action potentials. Now that's all that they want to do. So they need help from everybody else to do everything else for them because all they want to do is sit there and do that one job. If this was NASCAR, all they want to do is drive the car. They're the driver. They don't need to get out and change the tires. They don't need to get out and put some gas in. They don't need to rip that thing off the windshield, you know? So they need some support crew. They need their crew to come up and help out the pit crew are called the neuroglia. So the neuroglia are the support cells. These guys provide protection and nourishment, support in various ways for that nervous tissue. Now, as we get into chapter 12 with neurons, we will talk about the parts of the neuron. But real quick, you should be aware of three main parts. The parts of a neuron in here, let me show you in another image. Here we can kind of see how these neurons, they start looking like spiders, but they've got a super long tail. And that super long tail can be as long as three feet. And so I want you to know that the main fat part in the, of the cell is called the cell body. And hanging off of the cell body are what's called dendrites. Dendrites ex kind of extend the cell body so that it makes it possible to have more connections, to receive more incoming signals and transmit information. So dendrites are extensions off of the cell bodies. Dendrite means little tree. So it looks like trees without leaves. And then it's got that really long tail. And this is what I mentioned can be three feet long. This is the axon. So the axon is the really long tail. And this is what acts like the wire. So this is really carrying that action potential down the line towards something else, right? So again, cell body with its dendrites hanging off, and that long axon tail is really the wire that keeps that whole thing going. Here's the cell body. Here we can see some dendrites. We're assuming right there is an axon leaving, okay? And here's another image that makes it easier. Cell body, dendrites, and here's an axon coming out. Here we can see some glial cells, some real glia kind of help it. Now, we're almost finished with this chapter, but we need to talk about a few more things real quick. Um, we're finished talking about the four major tissue types, but now we're going to start looking real quick at organs, and then we're going to look at membranes and at a, another couple concepts. So first off, don't forget that organs are composed of two or more tissues, and these two or more tissues are working together. Now here it says specific complex functions. That's true. So each organ is doing a more complicated function, and it's a very specific function. And so these organs are really groups of tissues working together. And we will talk about um, in our next chapter um, the integument. Uh, the, a good example, the integument, is of how these four tissues work together. So we will use that in our next chapter as a good example. Um, your skin of these, excuse me, I fast forwarded too fast, of um, this. So body membranes. Let's talk about body, body membranes next. Okay, A membrane, you need to know, is a combination of epi plus CT. So epithelial tissue bound to underlying connective tissue. Epi plus CT. Our body has four major membranes. These tend to line. They tend to cover. Um, and so here, let's just, just jump into them. Here's the four. Mucus, serous, cutaneous and synovial. Let's start with the first one that might jump out and to me that's synovial. So a lot of people know that that's inside of joints, right? So a synovial membrane is going to line the inside of a joint and it's going to make that synovial fluid. The next one that triggers me is cutaneous. 
if you know that word cutaneous, so the word subcutaneous, you know that refers to your skin. So the cutaneous membrane is actually your skin, your epidermis and your dermis. Okay, so there's those two inside of your joints and your skin. And then we've got these two, mucus and serous. Mucus membranes, these are going to line cavities exposed to the outside line cavities exposed to the outside so like in your nose you're going to have cavities exposed to the outside in your sinuses and so all of that's going to be lined with mucous membranes mucus your digestive tract is exposed all the way from your mouth all the way to the exit there it's basically exposed to the outside and so mucus lines the entire thing so there's a mucous membrane serous membranes this is our last one, and then we're going to talk about them in depth a little bit more. Serous membranes, these line, these are your body cavity linings. So we talked about visceral and parietal layers um, in our first lab. These are your serous linings. The visceral pericardium is a type of a serous membrane. Parietal pericardium, okay? Again, mucous membranes line compartments open to the outside. Digestive, respiratory, urinary, repro. Again, all of these are going to have mucous membranes. And the, another word for that is <clears throat> mucosa. So you may hear of respiratory or digestive mucosa. And so this is just the mucus lining in that region. Okay, mucous membrane lining. So mucosa lines anywhere exposed to the outside, and it makes mucus. Not too tough. Serous membranes, again, they line body cavities. So these are our visceral and parietal layers. In between the visceral and parietal, I want you to know that there is a serous fluid that's made. So in between these two layers is a fluid, and that allows these two layers to slide on each other without separating, right? So it reduces friction, but because there's a vacuum in here, because there's fluid, those two layers won't separate. So that keeps your lungs inflated, actually. And we'll talk about that when we get to 211. And serous membranes line body cavities, visceral and parietal layers. Cutaneous membrane, this is your skin. And I don't forget that I've already mentioned it, it doesn't say it here, but this is your epidermis plus your dermis. And we'll get to that in our next chapter. So epidermis plus dermis is the cutaneous membrane. It lines our outside, protects us from all sorts of things, prevents us from dehydration. The last one is the synovial membrane. And the synovial membrane, it lines joints in the body. It lines most joints in the body that we think about. And it produces that synovial fluid. Again, that synovial fluid is going to help reduce friction. It's kind of like an oily secretion. Um, and something that a lot of people don't realize is that it actually acts like blood for cartilage. It gives cartilage its nutrients. Cartilage is like a sponge, and it is avascular too. So it needs something to kind of, kind of some fluid to go in and out of that sponge to help supply those cartilage cells, those chondrocytes, with their nutrients and take away their waste. Now, let's look at some of the possible tissue modifications as we get older with aging and development. Metaplasia, change of epithelium to a different form. So metaplasia, um, if epithelium adapts to environment, to a new, to a change, then that is referred to as metaplasia. Here's a bad form of metaplasia. Smokers, how they change the epithelium that line their trachea, that line their respiratory passageway, and it burns the cilia off, and it takes away the ability for them to get rid of that mucus as well that's in their lungs. Okay? Acid reflux, here's another one. If you don't take care of your acid reflux and you're going to change the epithelium in your esophagus and then you're going to start having issues with swallowing. You're not going to be able to swallow properly. Definitely not a good thing. We had a uh, security guard at the Northwest campus for years who, had, who didn't take care of his acid reflux and he had to have surgery three times a year just to re-stimulate the muscles and, and the tissue in his esophagus to work because of all the degradation he'd had. So definitely, it's not something, you know, heartburn, acid reflux, take care of that, folks. Hypertrophy versus atrophy. Most people have heard the word atrophy, right? Atrophy means to get smaller, to shrink. If you, use, if you don't use it, you lose it. 
right? And that's kind of the thing. So if we don't use it, then we're going to start to lose it. And so atrophy is the process of losing and shrinking a tissue. Hypertrophy is the process of increasing that tissue or increasing the size of the cells in that tissue. Okay, so I'm not, I don't really care about this hyperplasia, plasia. you can look at that, neoplasia dealing with tumor development many times, hyperplasia, increased number of cells in a tissue, um, you know, could be, for example, like a uh, callus. Um, necrosis, let's talk about necrosis real quick, necro referring to death, right, so tissue death following injury, so if the tissue is injured and it dies, then that is a necrotic or a necrosis process. Okay. As we get older, and we're going to learn this, um, this is kind of the first time that we're seeing this. At the end of most of our chapters, we talk a real quickly about aging. So here is my one-time spiel about aging, and we'll hit this over and over again, and you'll repeat it probably. But everything craps out as we get older. That's just what happens, folks. As we get older, this is my scientific terminology as well. Everything craps out. Everything slows down. Everything stops doing what it was doing. And so we're going to start to see issues because in every single system, as we get older, things are not working as fast and as efficiently. And so support, maintenance, replacement of cells, we're going to start to see less efficient as we get older. Um, structure and chemical composition many times become altered. So thinner skin, for example, as you get older, you start to have more thin skin. Um, declining amounts of fibers, tissue repair takes longer, our bones get more brittle and easier to break, um, more atrophy in our muscles and our nervous system. So all of this, especially if you have bad diet and you have circulation problems, you're going to encourage this. So the key, definitely take care of yourself, especially with your diet and your exercise, um, be as healthy as you can and that's going to help resist this aging process as much as possible. All right, folks, that's it for Chapter 5, and I do believe that that's it for um, all the information for this first test. So please make sure that you're studying hard, you're using your notes that you're taking in class or here on these, these um, presentations, these recordings, and you're using those notes with your, um, with your study questions, and there um, you're going to start being ready for a test based on those two resources. All right, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch. Have a great day.